Welcome to the MMHP and the 989, channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history. Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker. I want to welcome you to the Michigan Music History Podcast. I am flanked by Michigan Music Royalty. To the left, Dr. J. To the right, Sir Fred. We cut from just around the block of the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, here at Studio 163 in Essexville. And now it's time to grab a favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us through Michigan's rich music history. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric, Electric Kitsch, Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. And now, here's your host, Scott Baker. Hey, we are back at Studio 163 here in Essexville, and we have a, a cold, blustery, interesting weather week here. Slippery also. You can snow watch your on, step snow out there, off, man. yeah, rain, everything. And snow coming tonight, and they said next week, middle of the week, more oh, crap geez. coming in here. But here we are in the winter, and in our season two, and uh, special guest in the house tonight, Dave Preger, Mr. Ronnie Round himself. We are doing our first punk episode, and he's going to take us through the Michigan music history version by uh, by his, uh, through his eyes, I should say. And how you doing, Round? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. You're doing fine? All right. I got Dr. J in the house. Dr. J, what's new? Uh, well, we're definitely going to open the uh, Michigan Rock and Roll Legends Hall of Fame on March the 12th, Saturday at uh, a second Saturday presentation. I'm going to do uh, one on the book, uh, uh, Frankie Lyman's Tombstone Blues, and then we're going to open the the exhibit. And then that, that book day. is available for pre-order right now? It's available at the museum. You can call the museum uh, or just go there. It's, uh, the museum is open from uh, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. And, uh, yeah, Wonderful. everything's looking pretty good right now. Where, where's your museum at? It's at the Historical Museum of Bay County. Uh, uh, Washington. They, they've given us City Hall. Yeah, right next to City Hall on Washington okay. Avenue. And, uh, you know, we've got the... Uh, the second floor gallery, um, plus the stairwell and some uh, hallways as well that we've taken over. So I think it's going to be pretty cool. We got a, a nice video uh, component in there. So uh, that sounds it's exciting. Kind of a very miniature version of uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Michigan based. Though. It's, it's all so Michigan. cool. Yeah, definitely. I love. That you told me I saw Gary this weekend, and uh, he was telling me how cool the video is for it. And uh, a lot of people don't understand that. This whole project that he's been putting together, he's, he already has half of, or maybe a third of your stuff is over at Scotty's Sandbar too, right? Well, there's a there's a display at Scotty's. Yep. Uh, that's going to remain there. Okay. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of hard to put up a, a lot of uh, memorabilia in a bar. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, Scotty's done a pretty good job. You know, we've got it up high enough, the album covers and so on, that I think it's safe. And, you know, nobody's messed with it. That's great. Scotty's yeah. is a great place. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's where I saw around a distant few, few a few times over there that's so, been our home base since yeah. the beginning back yeah. when it was uh what was it before scotty's uh well it was just the sand shipwreck sandbar yeah, yeah shipwreck it was a shipwreck when we first started playing mm -hmm. okay yeah that's oh. right i forgot that they had changed mm -hmm. the name you know i remembered it as a sandbar when i first turned 21 that was quite the hot bar out there when i was turned 21 you know? it was shipwreck because that was that was i'm like i was something else that i remember but you've always called it the sandbar and that's all i know it now but yeah it, that, uh, that was the prior name i didn't know that yeah. okay. and that that was back in kmj's day it was the sandbar yeah you know all the rowdies call it that. yeah essexville zone yep. <laughs> <laughs> sir fred is in the house how you doing sir oh, i'm doing good good Good. Anything new this week? Well, just uh, working on my book, trying to finish it. How close are you now? Real close. Except I'm just trying to put it together. That's the hard part of it. But all, all the things that I want to write about, I think it's all there. It's just needs to be edited and put together in a readable mm -hmm. way. You've really been busting on it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this this past two months here of January and February, it seems to be your your focus. Well, so. I put a goal. I wanted to have it out this year, so it's already February, end of February or 
middle of February. And goes by so quickly, and it takes a couple months to have a friend, a couple friends of mine edit it. And, and then uh, at the printer, you never know how long it's going to take there where I get it printed at. That's awesome. So this is your third yep. book? Gary's first is coming out here when the Rockwell Hall of Fame Legends opens up here. Oh my gosh, you guys are rocking it! You know, everybody's really into the art right now, and uh, we—I want to say Mike Beatty's in the house too, our archivist. Thank you, Mike, for coming along. Uh, Round, you are back in the studio wrapping up an album that has been started how long ago? An EP? Bef- uh, before the heart surgery. When was the heart surgery? Because people don't 16. even know. 2016. August 2016. And you are going to put a little bow on the career of Round in a Distant Few with this release, you said? I've been thinking about it. There's other things I want to do, and I'm not getting no younger. Yeah. Well, you you do want to remaster the records, because I know that you've been in talks with me about that, so that's <laughs> yeah. something sweet. I know you do, too. No, well, I, I can't wait to dig into those things <laughs> in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was listening to one today, and I'm like, oh, oh, I'll get an idea for this. I do. You know, you just hear those... You're the way they were recorded back in the day, you know. Uh, Brown, take us back to Garber High School where you came out of, and uh, when did this start? When did this bug begin for you? Um, I started playing the keyboards when I was in high school. And back then it was like funeral dirge stuff. There's were you a, playing it in high school like for, or, or like at home? Or for at friend? home. Yeah, okay. You know. Yeah. You never did it for any choir performances or Garber band or anything. That was no, probably the last thing you were no, thinking of. I was of. still antisocial uh. then as well. <laughs> now, you went to school with uh, with the Burdens, right? That would have been... Did and, you graduate and, with Dave? And KMJ, yeah. Okay. KMJ band, too. Judy, Judy cool. Jacobs, was she in your class? Actually, Mary Ann Jacobs was in my class. Oh, okay. So Judy was a year or two younger then, right? Yeah. And um, our family and the Jacobses were very close, along with the Pascuzis. And we used to have a big picnic out at State Park every year, all of our families. Wow. You know, so. Yeah, I taught at Kramer Junior High for many years with Judy. You know, she was a real good friend of mine, and uh, I'm I'm really dating myself here, but I had Mary Ann in a catechism class and when I when I was teaching in Bay City. I my first job in Bay City was at St. Joseph Grade School, which where I went to school, and uh, they hooked me into teaching a catechism class. The most unlikely guy ever to teach catechism, <laughs> let me tell you. I did everything I could to skip catechism and skip mass. That was my specialty when I was in <laughs> Catholic school. Uh, but anyways, I, that's how I got to know Mary Ann and uh, Mary Ann's mother and uh, Judy, of course, who was a couple years yeah, younger. Suzanne. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's real interesting. Um, Judy gave me um, her mom's yearbook and she graduated the year after madonna's mother and so this yearbook was madonna well it was madonna fortin uh was her senior year. it's got all kinds of pictures of her as a cheerleader and you know president of the you know i don't know what sorry yeah interesting Uh, stuff my mom graduated with madonna's mom they were like oh really yeah so she went to saint joseph also yeah yeah so did my dad, but they don't know. They didn't know each other. They met at Chevy's. 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 Working at Chevy. Yeah, that's how they met. Hmm. Wow. Then once they got hitched, you know, she didn't have to work there no more. Oh, what was your mom's maiden name? Seaferly. Okay. So it, do you have that that yearbook? By any chance? Uh, I could because I have her box of stuff. Okay. And there's picture books where I opened one and. All the little graduation pictures fell out. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the. You're, coo- you're welcome to look at that stuff. Oh, I would want. love to. Yeah, and I was going to say I'd uh, I'd bring that uh, yearbook over and let you look at it if you didn't have a copy of it. My mom used to talk about Madonna's mom. Really? You know, yeah, uh, uh, they were friends. I don't know how close. You know. That's cool. Though. But I knew she died young and all that from an early age. And then my grandma and her grandma. 
used to sit together in mass. Oh, my Lord. I did not know that. Yeah. Well, you know, the nice thing about going to a small high school like St. Joseph was you knew everybody in the class. I don't know how many they had, but I'm guessing it couldn't have been, you know, much more than 30 or 40 kids in the graduating class. I know we had, our graduating class had 60 or 61, and that was the biggest graduating class I think it was ever at St. Joseph. So, uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Wow, I'll have to hook you guys back up again then. That's cool. That's... And my dad went to St. Joe's when he lived out at the farm by you. Oh, uh, uh, on Night and Ridge. On Night there. Ridge, there? yeah. Yeah. Supposedly walked there. But I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That's a pretty good hike. <laughs> I don't know, but you know. I'll both stories, ways in the snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the story grew in the telling. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have to walk to school. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, around. So you you were you were banging some dirges out while you were in high school. What year did you graduate, at Garber? Eighty-two. One. Seventy-eight. I was supposed to graduate in 76. No. I always get this wrong. Okay. Well, and then if you look at the 77 yearbook, you'll see a picture of me that says, hmm, how long have you been a round? <laughs> because I had to go back uh, for a half of credit because I flunked Mr. Middleton's government. Class. Perry. Perry Middleton. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's where I know you from, Ron. Is I used to hang out in Mako's basement, seventy four, seventy five, seventy six. Mm-hmm. That's probably where uh, you remember me from. Mike Beatty hanging out in Essexville. Yeah, and <laughs> Mako uh, went to All Saints uh-huh. after he got kicked out of Garber. Yes, most of my <laughs> friends did. And the Mitchells. Yeah, I got kicked out of St. John's, and I had to go to Garber. Oh. The year my mom was a uh, PTA president. <laughs> oh. Sister Don asked me not to return for eighth grade, so I had to go to Kramer. Oh, sheesh. <laughs> that was a culture shock. I bet. Going yeah. from St. John's to Kramer. I remember when they did it naturally in seventh grade or whatever it was back in my day, you know, and and they were like, all of them were, I mean, every kid was like, this is so cool to be able to kind of be open and do, have all these options. It was all, like all of them were like that. There wasn't anybody that didn't like the idea, but there was. I'm like, oh, I don't. I never had to go to Catholic school, so I didn't have to experience that. But, uh. You win. But <laughs> I I was thinking about that recently. You know that th- there's good memories of that too. Oh, yeah. Although you had to go to church every day, you know, and uh, the whole. Dressing in the uniforms, youth for Hitler thing, like you're all in the big line, you know, and hanging on to the person in front of you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's pretty kooky. <laughs> you know, and, and the penguins and the yardsticks. You know, but <laughs> that's all crazy. Uh, so you you were obviously getting home from school during that time period and losing your mind in some other kind of sounds. What were you listening to at that time? Bowie. Bowie. Until I discovered the Dead Boys. The Dead Boys. Yeah. That were the next one. Yeah, it opened up your mind and the to the Dictators. Something. Yeah. And then the Pistols. Yeah. And that came right around the time of graduation. Oh, eh? well, we all discovered it about the same time. If he was hanging in Mako's basement, he probably was listening to it too at about the same time. Well, but I think at that time they had the place above Freeman's there, uh, the old Irish's Market. Yeah. You know, uh-huh. they had an apartment above there. We won't go into that. <laughs> this, but uh, I. St- Started just a few with Mako. You you didn't uh, get into the New York punks, hmm? the New York punk scene. Not till I see them down at my old theater. The that's the Emerald now. That I always dreamed about making a music theater when I worked there. Huh. Well, I wasn't going to talk about that. Okay, you could talk about it. No, bring it on. I was in adult entertainment, and I used to work at. I had a drive-in in Algonac, and in the winter time. I would go to work at the adult theater in Mount Clemens, which was called the Jewel at the time, and it was humongous. And now it's the Emerald. Uh huh. I've been to the Emerald. Yeah. Well, picture being a young pup 
running projectors with of that big porn. No, porn's got nothing to do with it, except that's what paid my bills. You know, but <laughs> no, looking out that window, running the projectors and that big stage and everything, that's all I could picture was a music theater, you know. And then mm-hmm. years later, I went to a big punk rock show there and I was like, dang, it, it's real. <laughs> the vision came true in another yeah. sense. Yeah. D- did that. Uh, and it's not Miss New Detroit. <laughs> well, when you went the punk rock show, did that have like the Ramones or some no, of those people? Or I'll what? tell you exactly who it was. I went there because the Dickies were playing, and I had never seen the Dickies. Okay. And the Damned were playing. The Damned from England? Yeah. Really? Wow. Yep. And then uh, there was Agnostic Front and some New York bands there, okay, that I had never seen. And then a band called Balzac from Japan, okay. It was a really cool lineup, yeah. except that the main liners were supposed to be the misfits. And you had all these little kids dressed up with their misfit garb and that, you know, and the masks, and that all geeked up. So here's their headlining. Mm-hmm. Not the damp, not the dickies. <laughs> but for them, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the misfits. And here's what you get for the misfits. All right. That the muscle bass player with the squirrely banks. Marky Ramon on drums. Really? Yes. Sitting in. And then a, a young pup on guitar that looked like Greg Script Jack. Hmm. And uh, all the songs were the same beat, and it sounded like the mist. Like uh, the Ramones do the Misfits. No doubt. It sucked. We left like after one song. No Danzig? No what? No singer? No, it was just that Jerry Only guy was. Oh, when Jerry Only was of them. Okay. The the muscle bass Bass dude. player dude, okay. Yeah, and then a kid that looked like Script Jack uh-huh. on guitar, and then Mark Ramon on drums, and it was all the same beat. Whoa. And it was terrible. <laughs> what, a, what a memory. What year was that? I don't have a clue. Mm hmm. You'd have to ask, 80s. Neil, ask Neil. Yeah, okay. He remembers all that stuff. Hmm. No, so, it wasn't the 80s. It was the 90s. Oh, yeah? That was your first trip to the Emerald? Since. Since the day, yeah. Since the takeover. And that's yeah. when you started getting into New York bands? New York punk? No, I, I liked the Dictators. Okay. I always liked them from the second I heard them. Okay. I still cover them. Yeah. Did you ever run into um, Jerry Vile, I think his name was, Mm-mm. out of Detroit? He had a, a punk band, and he was very <clears throat> well-known. I booked him up in Saginaw once, and they got fired. I, I heard of a few I've heard of After them, a couple of songs, because they were so vile. <laughs> and that was his last name. <laughs> We've had those days, too. <laughs> Uh, I'll just tell one. The place in Frankenmuth, they used to have the bands. They had, we brought the bands back because Homie was uh, working at Zenders or the Frankenmuth Little Caesars, I can't remember, but he was Kid Frankenmuth at the time. You know. Who's this? Homie, our original bass player, my friend Ray Clark that we brought up. Okay. From. Royal Oak to start my restaurant and the band. He was the bassist with the big Robert Smith hair and you know the chain that went from the ear to the nose. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, people weren't ready for him up here. Especially in Frankenmuth, eh? No, or Bay City. Yeah. You know. Anyways, uh, that place I can't remember what the name of it is right now. But he was that the one that used to be a restaurant? Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, they had a pretty good lineup of people that would play there. I know Dick Wagner played there yeah, a number yeah. of times. And then they quit having bands, and then we were the first band back, and everything was cool until, like, they got new carpet, and uh, the manager, uh, she was gay. Mm-hmm. And 
homie and his wife got into an argument and he was doing his song she's a dyke and it went into swear words and they had that brand new carpet and he yelled she's a motherfucking dyke you know mm -hmm. and flips the cigarette through the air and it lands on the brand new carpet and that was the end of us playing there <laughs> But he was the one that's got us in. He was the one that got us out. Wow. A true and, punk and that, rock moment. No, yeah. and not, I don't mean that bragging in any way. No, no. Because we were just like, we watched, me and Neil and Mako watched that sig just like fly through the air like, oh, man. You know, and that lady uh -huh. standing there, it's like, whoosh, and he already, you know. Oh. And Neil is uh, Rob Atha, who's been your longtime right. partner on uh, a lot of this. Back a long ways for your production work and your guitars and songwriting. Me and Mako and Homie brought him in when he was a kid. Yeah? Yep. And Mako's name is, real name is what? Mark Nearing. Mark Nearing, okay. Yeah. I just want this for on the podcast so people know if they're looking up the names. You're using a lot of slang that only some of us would know today. I always do, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I have my own language. That's all good. How did Aetha get the name Neil? Uh, because when we had the restaurant, you remember the young ones? No. The, the, the English, English punk series? Punk show. series, yeah. There was Neil the hippie. Oh. And he, he cooked it. There were a bunch of English school kids, and they were all different. Vivian was the punk. with the, He had the studs in his forehead and... Uh, that was a funny series. It was there was a kid that was like a suit, but he was shifty, you know. And then Neil was oh heavy, you know. <laughs> he was Neil the hippie, and that's how Neil was when we first met him. You know, the we we're like, sorry, kid. Anyways, uh, <laughs> everything was heavy and stuff, you know. So I just called him Neil, and then. And I guess we put on Jones because the guitar player was Steve Jones of the Pistols or something. Somehow I added Jones on it, you know. Yeah. Ronnie Round, Neil Jones, yeah. Ho Homie, and Mako. Oh, man. The Is that the original player. lineup? Yeah. What year did you guys go out for your first time? 1990. 1990. Now, before that, give us a little backstory of coming out of high school in the 70s then and. Where, what's what did you do musically that built this up? I mean, that was your first real trek to the stage, or had you done a few I things before that? I had a bunch that? of weird songs, and you know, the neighborhood kids thought they were cool. That, but it was funeral dirge, and uh, I experimented with drugs at the time, you know. And there was like just really weird songs, and uh, we did. I did a solo. I had a farfisa. I think I bought it from Dave Davenport. I'm not positive. But anyhow, we did, it was called the Midland Backyard Tour. <laughs> it was like this rich girl's house. And it, it didn't go over well. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, probably 70s. Really? I probably was still in school. You got any tapes of that later? No. There you go. Get that back... <laughs> Box set history stuff. Oh, there. I got, I got demo tapes of the funeral dirge stuff. I'm yeah. gonna be digitizing it. There you go. <clears throat> like I did the dear mom thing. Right. Yeah. But. Yeah. So that took you through the '80s, just experimenting and writing. And what year did you decide no, I want to get in going? The '80s. Because you you got a lot of '80s in your sound too for the, right. the for well, your style I, of punk is okay. There's a blend. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep it short. When I graduated in 77, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the only place hiring back then, there wasn't a lot of jobs with Cinemarts, and that's how I got into that business. Okay. Mm -hmm. I went there, and uh, I went up the ladder fast. It was easy. You know, it wasn't even like a job. It was just simple. You know, if you could tolerate it, you know, there's a lot of weird stuff. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I shot up the ladder fast, went to Fort Wayne, Indiana. Being a young pup, they would send me to places where like family people wouldn't want to go because I was a kid. Okay. 
So I went to Furwing, Indiana, got blasted out of there, and uh, ended up in Algonac with my own drive-in on 28 acres of land with two private spring-fed ponds and uh, the Algonac State Forest over here. Uh -huh. And then when they turned it adult entertainment, the two neighbors on this side were our houses. So it was nice. For nine years, it was a boy and his dog fishing, hunting, whatever I wanted right on that land. Oh, wow. But to, <clears throat> but to get to the point, it had a trailer, and I lived right on the property. And I wrote the whole different shade of gray through the 80s uh, on that Farfisa in the trailer. So that came with you? You took that around with you? Oh, yeah. Huh. Where did you record a different shade of gray? That had a you know, kind of like a big... I, I was kind of surprised because I I guess I would listened to some of your stuff in reverse order. Yeah. And then all of a sudden this comes up and it's just like all these production things and synthesizers and... Uh, a different shade of gray was all the songs that I've written from the... or songs taken from the 70s when I was a kid with the funeral dirge. Uh, through the Algonac years, you mm -hmm. know, the trailer. Uh, and uh, Dear Mom's recorded in the trailer. Oh, yeah? I didn't know that. And um, anyways, to answer your question, Frank Michaels had a studio back then called Poseyville Studios because he lived on Poseyville Road. And... Uh, I don't know how I met them. Somehow I met them through Z93 because my son. No, that can't be true because I recorded it there. <clears throat> I don't know how I met them guys, but we got to be mates. And I recorded out there. John Presler uh, produced it as well as Frank. You so, know, and, and that was that was your, and that's where we did different shade of gray. Twelve, thirteen years of music, your first record, and you had all the years to write it. Yeah, so you had so all the ideas all the good, going into it. It was like my never, my greatest never released hits. Okay, you know, big debut. Yeah. Did did Aetha play on that album? Mm, yes. Yep. How about Mako? Was he in there too? Uh, Mako wasn't with us at that point. I think it was Todd Kula or Johnny Curry took Mako's place. Mako went on to do something else. I can't remember. Same homie went on to do Beaver Shoot, the punk porno rap thing out of Detroit. Yep. Forgot about that. I remember hearing about that. So that's when I got Jody Buchek was on bass. Okay. Huh, so Steven it, Kelpinski on keyboards. And then I think later Judy. Yeah, Frank and Judy, they were, yeah. they were still playing together, those two. And they're still playing with me, too, the last show I did there with us. Wonderful. Wow. Cool. That, so that, that came out in 90, around 91, somewhere around there? That was 93, wasn't it? Yeah, the CD was, 87 was the, I don't... So it got put it, on it, CD later. Yeah. If we look on the round in the distant few Facebook, it'll tell us. Yeah, okay. I, don't, I, yeah. Can't I think it was 93, because that was on there That's, today, looking yeah. at it. Okay. Then Love and Pain was like 95 or 90. I think most impressive, girl, most impressive girl cassette to hold them over till Love and Pain came out in 97, I think. Because that only release? No Love and Pain was CD. But Most so, Impressive Girl was cassette. That's what I mean. Did, did, that, did you put that on here? No. Pissed at, or no. Pissed at the World was a single version. That's the one that we got the overseas airplay with. Uh, Pissed at the World Vampire and I can't remember the third one. When you were doing those and you started doing shows, did you go out with uh, anybody else? I mean, who, who were you getting booked with? Any good pairings along the way of Michigan artists that you... Sure, Fusty Cadavers down in Max. Yeah, in Detroit? Yeah, and then we did the 
one of the first benefits for that uh, Lucinda Williams, the Sweet Relief in Dayton. We did that. A show? Yeah, the Sweet Relief. I didn't know you were on that. Dayton, yeah. Oh, okay. With Ooh. Adam and some other bands. What What exactly was the Sweet Relief? It was that Lucinda Williams, what is she, folky? Yeah. Well, yeah, Americana, Americana, I yeah. think, would probably be a better I've got both for. the Sweet Relief releases, mm-hmm. that CDs that are out from back then in the 90s that came out, but uh, I didn't know they had shows, I guess. Yeah, in Dayton, they were all over America. And you guys got on that bill, right? Well, The internet was a small world then. True. That's how me and Toshi met. met. And I had a friend, Igor Vaganov, in Russia, playing my stuff in Russia. You, you, know? you, you're, you got the word out overseas right away on the internet. You were one of the first internet punk things to go out there, that's for I sure. I was one of the first internet, period, because I read an article that Aerosmith was on Yuma. Did you ever hear of that? hmm Okay. So I was like, oh, I got to get on this, you know, because Different Shady Grey just came out. And uh, so I went to my friend Tom Grant, God bless me, with us no more, uh, had a girlfriend who also named Prager, no relation, had a computer, all right? So I went to Radio Shack and bought a CopyServe 2.0. You had to buy them Mm -hmm. back then and took it to her house, and it was like, you know, the old dial-up, and it took oh, care yeah. of oh, yeah. stuff. But the world was a small place, and the news groups were like little clubhouses. Yeah, they were. Yeah. You know, and I, I was hanging out with Nico Case. I know this is going to sound like bullshit, but it's the truth. Nico Case, because she was in Cub, okay? The Deftones, uh, hung in the same thing, the Slipknot. Yeah. We're all a little group of goops, you know, that uh, the chick with the, who saved us? Jewel. Yeah, she was in there. Huh. And uh, they all went on to become famous but me. <laughs> so, but I was DIY. You know? Yeah. And yeah. it took the Deftones like two years to get on MTV from when we were all doing the Vitties, yeah, you know, yeah. we're all on the video shows together too, you know, and wow, they all even that uh, those wankers that they sold out. What was, I can't think of Santa Monica. Who sings that? Sublime. No. Or oh, uh, I know who you're talking about. Uh, Art Alexis there, the alexicus whatever his name is well, yeah. when they yeah. when they first came out when we were all doing our stuff ours was disappointed was the first video uh that that guy or that band was doing heroin girl Everclear. yeah thank you al <laughs> al, <laughs> al coming in from the uh texting to to answer your question yeah, yeah. Everclear. clear they call them all wankers that sold out huh but I, that's just my opinion. I hear you. A lot of people like them. Yeah, no, they did. They all went. Everybody went their own way. But you were in. That's some of that little club that you initially were in when the net started. That was a huge thing. Ever, Everclear came in when we started doing videos. Okay. Okay. But Jewel and all of them, you know, they all. Well, you know, look mm-hmm. at Slipknot. Yeah. Slipknot hung with us in the chat or the in the, in the chats, you know, because yeah. you were all in the. News groups together. Mm-hmm. That's how me and Toshi met. Toshi is from Japan. Mm-hmm. We're in that international group together. Did, didn't Toshi do the album cover for? No, that's Toshi's uh, wife. Did the album cover for Alone? Alone and uh, and Love and Pain. Correct. Okay. I remember when you said Toshi did that, and you're like, "Look at this! Is what my fans are doing right now." I think I was sitting with the Essexville somewhere. We were just hanging out in the afternoon and. Your your mind was blown by this kind hearted stuff coming from around the world, directed towards you, and one of those I'm big in Japan kind of guys, but <laughs> couldn't even go over no, there and tour. To, no, Toshi was uh, Toshi was my bandmate in the International Project, but, but yeah, we were friends before that. Yeah, though. you know, FRT was that band. 
This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. They offer new and used records, including local to Michigan original vinyl and CDs, as well as clothing, electronic equipment, funky household items, music gear, and stringed instrument repair. You can find them on the web or call 989-402-1411. That was Rock Your Ass. Is that one of the video <laughs> things? Rock your rock your rock your ass was a TV show in uh, Chicago. Larry did one too. Um, what year was that that you did rock your ass? That's probably around ninety five because love we're doing the love and pain songs. Okay, but it's live, and uh, Neil breaks a string and then right. he he. Somehow his cord was going or something, you know, and me and Scooter were, like, tripping out because Scooter was playing drums. And, you know, Scooter co-wrote Pissed at the World, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, Well, you guys covered that pretty well, though, you know, when he broke the string. It, it was like kind of like a bass and drum solo going on there for a while. Oh, well, Jeremy Race was the bassist. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember. And he had that fancy lad. He was with the rugby's for a long time. That's right. And he had that fancy lad bass. What is that, a five-string or something? It's been a while, but yeah. Well, it's what not a whole lot of people have them, but if you're mm-hmm. good, you can play them. And he, uh, him and Scooter covered it, yeah. Damn. <laughs> I, I haven't seen that video in years. I mean, it's probably since it's it was on, been uploaded. It's all over the internet. I hear about mm-hmm. it all the time. Yeah, it's on YouTube. It'll come when, right uh, up. When my friend Cubby, uh, Kevin Cole from Marine City, not this Kevin Cole, he did Dear Mom with me. Uh, he watched that after we released Dear Mom, and he was like, oh, man, you looked really mad on that. You know, and I hear that all the time. And I remember the chick saying he looked like he's going to kill someone there know? there hasn't been a gig you haven't played where you don't have that look though they don't realize you're in the moment you know i mm-hmm. every time i've ever seen I you on real, stage i don't realize you don't you're, you're happy and hanging out outside of here or not happy all the time but you're 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 a nice person to hang out with but when you get on stage you got a, that persona it hits it's you're thinking of shit you got your your minds uh, into the music you know and mm-hmm. or whatever's wrong you know and it's got it's eating at you. I guess I don't know. <laughs> I just play to have fun, and I always thought. <laughs> yep. Because uh, Mick Furlow said that to me once. He's like, "You know what I dig about you guys? You don't care what nobody thinks. You just play to have fun." That's cool. I'm like, yeah. Well, you can do that again too. You know, because he was all over hometown heroes when. I first moved back from Detroit. Z93, Hometown Heroes. Yep. yep. Individual was the one that we had the airplay with. That's how I met Lizard. Me and Lizard became friends because we were at Scotty's hmm. when it was a shipwreck, and he had Lizard on the rise. And he, I think we were recording at Ziggy's, and he was recording at Ziggy's, Love and Pain. Hmm. And uh, anyhow, I hope I'm not boring anyone. No, this is your backstory. We're, this is what we're here for. Anyway, uh, Lizard had heard Individual on Z93, and he's like, yeah, that sucks pretty cool. And we've been friends ever since. Well, what's he doing now? Uh, his video thing. Yeah? I, I kind of lost track. Yeah. Dark House. Okay. So he took the 90s. That's that's when I first came to know of you and get to hang out with you and... I was in college during that time period and catching shows and listening to the records. And what uh, propelled you to continue on? I mean, did, was there? Does, I mean, even till now, you got more story to tell, and the story's coming to an end. Well, what I left something out. We start me and Mako and Homie and Neil started Distant Few up here version in '90, but the original version. And here's the MC5 story took place when I lived in Royal Oak in the late 80s at Rob Tyner's house with Rob Tyner Jr. on drums. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that was the first distant few. So anyways, Rob Tyner Jr., uh, Brendan Donovan, and me 
we're practicing, you know, and uh, Rob Tyner Sr. says, hey, you guys are ready for management, and then, like, whispers, ditch the old guy. And I was only in my 20s, and they are in their teens. And I don't know how old he was with his big wrestling belt and Ted Nugent moccasin boots. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> And I was like thinking, man, what a wanker, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you think he'd be on your side at that point. And movie. the other and and like Brendan Donovan's mom and uh somebody else's mom were all calling Rob Tyner like, Don't throw him out, he wrote the songs, you know. And what did Rob have, ever have to say to you? Anything good? Huh? Did he ever talk to you? The only thing he ever said to me was when I met him. He's, he said to me personally, Rob Tyner, and shook my hand with the wrestling belt and the... Moccasins? <laughs> yeah. That was it, just to introduce himself to you. Mm-hmm. And then the, that was the only other time I heard him talk, and it wasn't directed to me, but about me. And it's like, you guys are ready for management. Who's the old guy? Wow, right in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> in my 20s. So then when he... The day he died... Uh, we were playing the shipwreck and I said uh, I'm going to do this song for a friend of mine and then I went no that's a lie he he wasn't my friend but I'm still going to do it for him in fact he was kind of an ass that's what I said <laughs> but uh, we did like a dictator song for him or something oh. did you guys ever cover an MC5 tune before that or no Mako Mako yeah KMJ yeah Mako, he but before Mako died, he was doing stuff for the record store, fixing up guitars for him. You know the kitsch, as yeah. electric kitsch. Yeah, and they gave him like some imported MC5 album. He was so proud, and you know, just before he went, man, he. Yeah. He was just. I didn't know he was a, down there at the kitsch. That there are kitchens are sponsor for the show, that's and uh, cool. I didn't know. I didn't know he I'm was working down there. Just going by what Marco told me. Wow, so, that's wonderful. You know? They're great people. Yeah, we, we, he was fixing up guitars for him when he when he died. I didn't know that. Jordan does his own now down there. Well, Marco was fixing them and painting them. You know how fussy he was. You know, it looked good. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. And he got that MC5 album. I think it was an import. And boy, oh boy, I heard about that for every day for a week. (laughs) Back in the 70s in this basement, I heard MC5 for the first time by KMJ playing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until, you know, a couple years later I heard an MC5 album and I said, they're about as good as KMJ. <laughs> <laughs> really? A lot of people said, it's like, yeah, just like the Stooges, too, you know. There's some people think this, that KMJ played that stuff better than Iggy. Yeah. You know. That's cool. Wow. You know? That's a cool backstory there. Yeah. So. So uh, what happened to Rob Tyner Jr. in the original round, uh, Distant Few? Uh, right around that time that me and you were hanging out. Mm-hmm. You know, the sig butt thing, we won't go into that. Yeah. At Hamilton Street Pub. Uh, he got a hold of me, and he was going to, he had his own band, and he was supposed to come up along with that, uh, I think it was the, I don't know if it was the Gorgor Girls or not, but they were going to come up and do a show with me, and then somehow. Uh, Hamilton Street Gorgor Girls show. I remember that. You're booking it. Dang. Takes me right back to... I remember you had all this stuff on the platter, and then it all I, fell through got, all the time. Actually, I got pushed out of the picture once I brought it up and gave someone in charge the number. I oh. was uh, cut out of the show. Oh. But. I remember you had a lot going for you, though. You, were, you had a lot of stuff arranged with Detroit artists and other punk bands, and you started a... Get the thing, the ball is rolling, but then something was always portrait happening. Of, portrait of Poverty coming every year from Washington, playing mm-hmm. the sawmill with us. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you put out an album in uh, 2021, right? 20. 
or 2020, but that was... No, like, no, not 2021. That well, was last year. That was two in 2021. That was last year. We're in 2021. Oh, it's probably well, that, this, where we released it digitally. Uh, the, love, the, love, and, got, love and Pain? Is that this the one? Is, well, this is yeah. from 98 or 97, though, right? Yeah, but it just was... It says 2021 because it was released digitally. And uh, you remember, Scott, because that's when you first yeah. started talking about... Yeah, when I was doing stories. Oh, no, when you first started talking about remastering it for me. Oh, yeah. Well, the Rob's been talking about that with me for a few years since I've got my studio <laughs> going. We but, added the uh, um, New Order cover on it when we reissued it. Okay. Because uh, I got finally distribution through DistroKid. Right. That's why we're all... Yeah. I've got the original three, anyway, CDs here. That's good. Yeah. I don't even have them. No, nope. you always supplied them so I could write about them, you know. But uh, well, you and Tom Gilchrist. <laughs> Tom Gilchrist. <laughs> yeah. Now is that the is that the album that has Bizarre Love Triangle on it? A Bizarre Love Triangle just got added to the digital thing in twenty one. Oh, so that's a bonus track. Yeah. Okay. So that's a more recent recording then. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh no, it was recorded for a. a New Order tribute album, okay. and then uh, they said different genres and that. Anyways, when we submitted it, they're like, "Hey, no punk rock, only electro, blah blah blah, and stuff." You know, that's what happened to us when we played overseas too. We were DIY cassette only. You know, Lord Litter, who was giving us the airplay, friend of Toshi's, he was German. Um sent me to a distributor in England, and I called him on my mom's phone in England, you know. And I was like, yeah, we need distribution. We're getting airplane. Um, what are you playing? Or what kind of music do you play or whatever, you know? I said, punk rock. And he's like, no, we only do techno or something like that. <laughs> really rude like you hear about, you know. Right. And, uh, and then he said... What format? And I said cassette. And he said, "Good luck." And just <laughs> that was the end of that. So you you didn't? They rejected your cover of Bizarre Love Triangle. Then? No, it, they rejected the whole album. That was yeah. pain. But what my my point is, did it get on the the tribute? Oh no! For New Order? No, that the tribute didn't accept it. No. And then we did a cover that people have been trying to get copies of of, uh, Naked Ray Guns Holding You, Mm. the word got out that we were going to be on the tribute album. And like everybody's been bugging me every so often over the internet for years, like, hey, man, how do I get a copy of that? You don't, you know? (laughs) But Neil's hunting it up right now to we're going to finally release it. But what happened to that compilation was... uh, the label ran out of money or something. I don't know. Yeah. Probably some school kid. Who knows. Yeah. Big dreams and didn't have the pocket to, f- to back it. Right. It just, happens. Just like me in the hall shows. <laughs> yeah. Always scraping by, but somehow we made them. You know? Right. Jamestown. Uh, no, Lincoln Road Link- was the ones I put on. Oh, well, here in town. That's right. That was before. okay. I'm thinking James Hall and Saginaw. That was where the big ones. But we played there. Yeah, I remember you playing there. But... Ethan was who put those on. Okay. You know. Remember the days of the hall shows. Those were some of the first ones that my generation, anyway, before we were 21, we were at a lot. You know, because those were kind of the open places to go before the bars. And Jamestown was where I got my tooth chipped because I thought I would be cool. All the moshers were out front, and I thought I'd be. Mr. Cool Guy, he might go out in the middle of you know, pop, got oh. the mic right and chip my tooth. Oh. Didn't miss a word, though. <laughs> you know, but, man, <laughs> stupid. Uh. There's been lots of dumb stuff, but I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, coming out of the 90s into the aughts, I know you, were, uh, you, you put a few different lineups together trying to keep the boat float there. And, 93... Uh, Neil and Kurt and John went their own way, and that's when I got 
uh, Jody and Johnny Curry and Frank and Judy and Presler, and we won Best Alternative Band that year. That was 93? Mm-hmm. Holy crap. Yeah. And Radiotherapy was out. That's where they all went. Yeah. Robin, though. They all went there to do their own thing. Mm-hmm. So give us a little bit of rundown of where you were heading going into the change of the century there. Where was your head at? Internet got a little bit better. Actually, what happened was Toshi and the FRT thing happened first. Toshi and Francois. Toshi was sad because he didn't have a band. Francois lives in Paris. He's the guitar player. Toshi's keyboards and everything else in FRT. And, uh, and well, now he's Mr. Horror Soundtrack composer, you know that. If you follow my Facebook, you know, he's mm-hmm. putting out something every week. But anyways, <coughs> Francois' girlfriend lived in Japan. Francois w- went to see his girlfriend in Japan, and him and Toshi wrote, like, all this crazy Frank Zappa-like stuff. Then they sent it to me, and it was the only music of, I, I've ever had to transcribe. I don't ever had to do that myself. You know, and mm-hmm. I had to write it out because it was just like Zappa. It was everywhere, you know what I mean? You had to give yourself some kind of a uh, map, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we did, and uh, one song was called Alien, and then the other one was about Meat Man, Polly's brother, the Burden sound guy. Uh, Paul Schultz. Paul Schultz's brother, Joe, Joe yeah. that died. Uh, one way ticket to hell. It was about that. Mm. So you did all the lyrics to the music. They sent you the music, and then yeah, and you did I the had, lyrics. I had to drive to Detroit because you had to do it all on computer, right? For the first time. Yeah. <laughs> so I went down to the studio. My friend Joe Glass had moved to Dearborn, and he opened a studio called MFG uh, with with Gordon. But like LaRouse, the Rowdies, or something like that. And uh, I did Toshi stuff there, and I liked it so much, and them so much, that I told Neil and them, come on, let's go down there and do Alone, you know. Mm-hmm. And we did. It was a long drive every Sunday to Dearborn. Mm-hmm. But, uh, and it was always raining, and really hard where you had to pull over in that it seemed like <laughs> but yeah that's it that released in 2000 right right after the frt stuff okay i don't have any of the frt stuff yeah i can i can get that to you the alone though that's the ep that was your last that round of distant few up until this the one we're working on now. the one you're working on now which is wrapping up Everything since then. Right. Do you have a title for the new album that's coming out? Yes. It's called We Never Did It For You. We Never Did It For You. It'll be the last in the distant few. You're going to call it a career, you're thinking, with that one. Yeah. Fancy and uh, maybe a running around cover album. I've always wanted to do that. I have my own ideas about the associations, uh, never my love, my version. And... <laughs> covers yeah doing covers yeah undercover that's cool you know you you could also benefit just i think you have so much oddball video stuff that you've done all over the years to put a dvd out just compilating all your stuff from your videos to your to your personal stuff you know yeah i mean you're we've, one of the, like we've been working on that that'd be and cool you know that uh my next pro okay right now i'm Packing up the store because some uh, fascists bought the building and we're all getting evicted. Okay, so now you, my garage sale is going to be out of my house. <laughs> and uh, you you are currently own you own a record store called the Avant Garage Sale, right? That, yeah, but uh, it's it's yeah. it's just a booth and a yeah. I know where it's at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You ever but been there, Fred? You ever go to a record shop in there? No. And well, t- sure. shop. Where is this? It's uh, behind Dobson's. On uh, Wilder. Ran a car. Oh, There's I a big flea me, market yeah, behind there. He's got a record the store there. Oh. The old Jim. Well, you got two more weeks. 
I was Violence. wondering if they if they ever had records in there. No. Yeah, I do. I do, and then Don. The other guy has some down at the other end. Yeah. Yeah, Don. Well, Don passed on, and they got his stuff. Okay. You know, because he used his head ahead of time and had them give. He took care of his own business, and then when he died, they got his records. Now, is this uh, used records? Yeah. Yeah. And it's all types, or are you oh, pretty much all, specialized it's in all punk? genres? Okay, I even got the sappy organ once. <laughs> you know, you'll never see me play Dustin Nose. <laughs> okay, you know, I'm looking for uh, a Bay City Rollers record to display, not to listen to. Uh, would you happen to have any Bay City Rollers? Yes, there? I can hook you up. <laughs> All right. And it'll be my gift to you. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. I'm looking for one that has some tartan on the cover. So, oh, you know, yeah. we've got their handprints at the museum when they came here in I'll, I'll 1977. Look I'll look through them. I think I got two right. Ooh, all right. They they actually sell fast, you know, when you do have them. I was surprised. Yeah, I was, you know, went to some record stores. I went to Electric Catch, of course, and, yeah, I couldn't find anything. It's, geez. And I remember when they came up here in that i thought man what the pu you know because you watched them on saturday morning and they got little 11 year old girls like Ooh. Yeah. yeah you know what i mean and they had their shirts off and stuff you're like what the hell <laughs> you know what is this but then when i it's just like uh i never paid attention to them but now when these albums come in and i gotta play test them I'm like, damn, these guys are pretty good, man. Well, that you Saturday know. night was a, it was a pretty good song. Yeah, uh, you know that was the one that really broke them in the United States. Uh, but yeah, there were about five thousand of those little girls that I know. gathered there in front of City Hall when I they think, came to town. I think well, it was uh, a Sid and Marty Croft show. <laughs> Saturday mornings, and they'd be there with their little shirts off, man. <laughs> the young, like you know, prepubescent girls are like, oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like well, crazy. one of the guys in the band got in a little trouble with uh, <laughs> underage uh, girls, oh. I think. Oh, <laughs> boy! Yep. But we are we are getting the key. Uh, I'm trying to think. Derek Longmuir, who is the drummer of the Bay City Rollers, he had the key that uh, was presented to the band by then Mayor John Willerts back in 1977. And there is a, a pretty big Bay City Rollers fan club here in the United States that's still pretty active. And uh, the gals in charge of it, her name is Rebel. <laughs> Rebel D'Elia. Cool. Oh, that's a cool name. Yeah, I know it, isn't it? Just just sounds like a real punk yeah. tough gal. <laughs> punk so, and the Rebel Wilson. Y- yeah, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, she got uh, uh, Longmere to mail her the key. And uh, she lives in Kentucky, and I'm, I've just been emailing with her. She's going to she's gonna drive the key up here wow. to Bay City, nice. and we're going to mount it on the wall there at the That's Historical news. Museum. Yeah, so this is going to happen um, pretty soon. I, I, You know what? I hope she comes in the middle. I think it's going to be on the weekend, but it would be cool if she came here on a Thursday and <gasps> yeah. we could talk to her about the Bay City Rollers. But yeah, I don't know. totally. We'll see. But we are going to get that key. That's cool. There's some what, good keys. What year were the roller? I think I had my store here in Bay City at that time. Yeah, they hit it big in 1976. That's okay, when, I was because oh, my yeah. store, Saturday. my record shop here was 75 to 77. Yeah, and uh, by the time they came to Bay City, it was already they were on the downturn. I think they had maybe their last charting hit came out uh, when they were in Bay City, but they didn't perform. There was some sort of contractual wow. thing that sucks but, no, uh, I, don't, I don't even think i carried their album at my store <laughs> probably not you had you know fred you had kind of more uh, yeah, i don't i don't want to say yeah you didn't do too much of the pop right. stuff you know i you, i bought some pretty cool albums at uh at fred's did store. you go shop around at fred's store back in the day when you were a kid well i was in a davidson building let me let me answer that uh I got. I'm trying to remember. Ulsa, Ulsa Major. Ursa. Ursa. Ursa Major. Dick Wagner. Yeah, Dick yeah. Wagner's band. In my darkest hour. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, that album. Okay. <laughs> I had that one. 
Remember that. Oh, wow. You yeah. guys are all connected in a strange... All of us. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, you know? Record store owner, record store owner. I mean, Marco's this... Basement. Yeah, that's just wild. <laughs> so, round... I, I, you know, I've and I've told you this before, and you always usually laugh at me, but for people that have never heard you, because you have a very unique sound musically, it's a good combination of a lot of catchy, good stuff. What was your impetus for ideas behind... Like your creation of music, like what were your, what could you tag it to? A little bit of what, a little bit of what? Like what was your, how did you cook your your meal, man? Oh, I don't know. I just always wanted to do my own thing. It's and if, and if uh, it sounded like, you know, the song uh, for that I wrote for Gargoyle Girls, that B movie, uh, ripped me apart. If you listen to that, I thought that sounded like Danzig, and I hated that song because I like I sound like Danzig. Mm. You know that don't sound like me. I hear Cure know? in your music. I hear Bowie, probably Bowie. I hear Dead Boys. Oh yeah, and there's there seems to be uh, a lot of maybe songs about relationships. Is oh that- yeah, that's because I'm an L, uh, romantically. <laughs> well, you got you, there's a lot of loss, a lot of pissed off, a lot of losing, a lot and the, the, the angst. angst, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you're always looking to be the one that was beaten up all the time and come get me and then you laugh at at the face by the end of the tune. Which makes sense. I mean, that's total punk, but well, like, there's a long tradition of that. Mm-hmm. Del Shannon well, is the master of those kind of songs of, you know, heartbreak and you know, things yeah. going the wrong way, and yeah, you, know, you made a career out of that. <laughs> Honestly, what it was is that I know it's hard to believe, but I've uh, to this day I'm shy around yeah. girls, you know, and uh, that's why when I go in the grocery store, you get one on each arm. I'll never figure it out, man. Oh, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, that's one of your song titles, right? Shy Boy or something yeah. like that, yeah, yeah, and that is pretty fitting, it, that's pretty accurate. Shy boy, and all the girls that know me will call me that shy boy. But, um, yeah, that you see me with Rachel Shore, that's Dave Shore's daughter. I never met Dave, I don't think, or if I have, I don't. He used to do the parades and the telethons. Okay, Santa Santa Claus. Claus. it sounded familiar when you said it to me and you introduced me to her, but uh, okay, yeah, he is a cool guy. He's the only reason I did the telethons. It wasn't Terry Watson. You know, it was hey. like he was always cool. He'd ask us and we'd do it both days for four shows a day. In you the know, Bay City Mall? Like Essex Mall Mall here? So no, where, where'd you do no, it? Uh, one was at the old Labity mm-hmm. downtown. And then, man, they jumped around. I, I can't really remember. Mm-hmm. I remember. I remember the Labity was... The big one, you know. Is that Dunlop, Lobity? No, they were different ones. Oh, yeah. They're all in the ballpark there. I can't remember. Well, was, I he, think he runs that Dunlop. Building's still empty. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not sure. Oh. Fantastic, oh, I, right? It might have been that uh, building that Art was going to tear down. Um, it was created for tearing at one point, too. Uh, when I was at Banana Bay. Okay. Huh. So you it said... It was a car lot downtown and it was empty. That was the t- Jerry Lewis telethon weekends. Yeah. You got them all, all on video? You have copies of all that? Uh, I did. I don't know if I do. Neil should have them. I was going to say, that would be good for these this historical r- retrospective thing. Yeah. That's kind of cool stuff. Oh, you mean the... DVD doc- or something, documentary, yeah. The documentary series. Yeah. Yep. Now, if I remember correctly, um, Bizarre Love Triangle, going back there again. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a New Order fan. I can't help it. Um, is that the one you dedicated to Carrie? Mm-hmm. All right. Is there a story there that... Yeah. Is it a heartbreak story or... Mm-hmm. I had a best friend... Uh, when I graduated in January of 77, <laughs> I uh, met a girl down my basement, my mom's basement, you know, playing my music, and she thought I was cool. 
And uh, I ended up moving up to Hale. She lived in Hale. And uh, anyways, I came home one weekend. Oh, me and that girl didn't work out, but me and her sister did. Carrie was her was the one that we hit it off. Mm -hmm. And I came home one weekend to my mom's on the Bovish, you know, and my two friends, best friends forever, went up there with a ton of beer and got them drunk, and you can guess the rest. And, uh, oh, where's Ron? We were supposed to meet him here, you know? So then the guy that did that, his wife told me, because he came home and told her, okay, about it. And I was like, what the, you know, and I was going to you know, get violent, but he laid on the couch and <laughs> anyhow, to, to cut to the chase, uh, she ended up seeing, and I was stupid enough to do this, him, the one whose wife told me, me, rotating weekends. It was our love train. Oh, so that really <laughs> fit the picture there. Wow. Yeah. Wow, <clears throat> I I he did get some ultra violence, but not, <laughs> you know, to him. Well, yeah, from his wife, I mm -hmm. would think, you know, she knew what was going on and just accepted it. Jeez. Well, no. She come to my house after that. This and here's another case of the shy stuff. We had a swimming pool, so I was kind of popular. You know, and there's always girls over. And she came over to go swimming. We, she had her bikini on, and I had my swimsuit on. And we went swimming, and we got out. And something, I think, really would have happened, except that my friend came over, one of those that they come over and they don't know when to leave. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Just, like, hanging out and that, like make himself at home mm -hmm. so that never happened you said your your parents lived on the bobish mm -hmm. my dad was the beekeeper well where on the bobish because that's kind of where my roots uh, are but we're in we were in bay city okay. on rose street all right well we were three from the railroad tracks us then Dieters, then marinos okay so you between were between plumber and the tracks wow okay yeah. And my mom worked at Bush as a teacher's aide. All right, gee. Okay, I must have passed your house literally thousands of my times. My dad sold honey. He was the beekeeper. Okay, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. Where's your music going next round? You said you're, you're going to do some of the dirt stuff again, pull out something different. Uh, what's what's the future hold? What are we looking at? Uh, cover album. Mm-hmm. So the I'm thinking I I'd, I'd like to do it with the Hype Brothers because they've been my friends for a long time, you know, and just to be different. Who are the Hype Brothers? The Hype Brothers. Uh, they were in Wizard. Uh, right now they're the Weekend Warriors. They play a lot of like my birthday and stuff. <clears throat> okay. Because they do an excellent cover of Cowboy Song, my favorite Tim Lizzy song. Cool tune. Yeah. yeah. So would it be, would it be uh, asking you to divulge some secrets, to uh, ask you what what other things are you thinking of covering besides the association, which would have been kind of an unusual choice, for, you know, at least in my thinking of what you might pick out? I just... Probably for about 20 years I've been thinking about that association song. I think I can do something cool with it. And uh, I like it. And there's, let me, mm, I Want You Around by the Ramones. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure I could jot them down. Okay. I got so many that I love. and Yeah. Well, I love that song by the Ramones. That was my favorite song from their yeah. debut album. 
Well, thank you, Ron. We appreciate you coming on the show, man. Yeah, that was great. This is a little bit of history here from uh, center of mid-Michigan here onward. I mean, like Al and uh, the podcast studio, Studio 163 here that we broadcast from, this is one of the very original podcasting studios in town, the earliest podcast to come out of the Tri-Cities. That I caught on to. Then you were, yeah, and you were one of the earliest internet things, too, so yeah. a lot of uh, internet and digital age breaking information there. But without really knowing it, I did know about this because of the J-Mac thing. Right, it's a roundabout way. <laughs> yeah. Everything was tied together in our little town here. We all have been, though. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ron. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week posted every weekend. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredrife.com and the electric kitsch at electrickitch.com. This podcast wouldn't be here without special help from Studio 163's Alan Garcia, our podcast videographer and wingman, Mr. Mike Beatty, MMHP tagline specialist, Mr. Eddie Switek, and of course, Gary Johnson, Fred Rife, the electric kitsch, and all of our special guests, and especially you listeners. We want to thank you. You've been listening to the MMHP and the 989. From all of us at the podcast, we want to thank you for tuning in. I mean, the MC5 are legit to me. Yeah.